mom and dad are much more actively religious. You know, there's like a there's a Bible in the in the foyer, and there's a Bible in dad's uh, bedside table. Um, well, or arguably, they want to appear actively religious. But yes. yeah, I, I I think that I mean my intent was that they aren't super religious, but they probably still go to church. And they also probably they would feel bad if they put their Bibles away. They'd be like, oh, we need. You know, we need those to be out for us to look at, to right. consult in case we need them, yeah. or something. Um, but it's definitely, you know, I don't know, it comes from my own experience of my parents went to church and were more religious and, and stuff, and as, I don't know, around when I was like 10 or 12 or something, I was just sort of like, I remember having a conscious realization of just, no, this makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I was, like... This is all about a guy who was dead and then came back from the dead. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Magic isn't real. Wow. <laughs> uh, and and it was and then there was a you know a, a, a process of like just being like okay well I you know I'm just not going to go to church. I also remember having a conscious realization that the only reason I wanted to go to church was because after the service they gave you free donuts. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, that's funny. Uh, and so I don't know. It's probably just partially me projecting um, and trying to show that Sam is re-examining her own values as she as she gets older and grows out of childhood and doesn't necessarily share the same beliefs that her parents do. I never tried really hard to, like, I don't know, actually, yeah, I don't know, I, it was normal church behavior, like, I would go and, like, help out with, you know, my younger siblings and, like, my parents always went to church and whatever, and I would go along, and there were people, there was, like, a couple of people that I knew there and everything, but it took me until I, I was about, three, yeah, I think I was, like, 13 or 14, and I spent a significant amount of time really trying to, like, do the, to be like, all right, I'm gonna do this church thing, I'm gonna try really hard, and I, um, I would, like, get annoyed at people when they said, oh my god, and stuff, because I thought that was what we were supposed to do, and I think it was, I don't know, less of, like, whatever, six or eight months or something, and then I just, it broke, and I couldn't do it anymore, and I, I forget what I, I did something, uh, I, I ruined something, uh, in the church through total, uh, not caring. <laughs> I, um, I, I built a, I remember now, I built a house of cards out of a, um, Bible trivia, um, uh, like flashcards set. Yeah. Well, it was like, it was just like Journal of it was Bible based. Mm. Um, and I built like this big house of cards, and I, at one point, I remember thinking, all right, no, fuck it, and I glued the cards <laughs> into place. <laughs> so I had this big house of cards that was glued together, <laughs> totally like ruining all the gun in cards. And, um, at that point, uh, I stopped having to go to church so much. <laughs> One of the assets that I really liked creating in the game was uh, board games. So there's uh, three in total of them throughout the house. Um, ideally, there'd be more, but uh, you know we had to focus on the, the, getting the walls built and things like that. Um, but I really like them. They're just a, a simple extruded cube. Um, there's something about um, environment design that's really fun. It's really a goofy aspect of it where you have to create fake brand names. You have to create fake toys and fake storefronts. Um, maybe my favorite is... Um, in the game Costume Quest, when you're going to the shopping mall, there's a, a store called the uh, Why Not Flip Flops, uh, which always makes me really happy. But this one is a parody of um, Dream Foam, uh, which is an awful game that came out in the, in the early 90s, where you sit around a table with your, your real friends and you pick up this uh, plastic pink phone and, and call these, these sexy boys and you see which one likes you. It doesn't really suit Sam's personality exactly. I think you maybe always given to her by a, a well intentioned relative who doesn't quite have a personality. Uh, down, and maybe she played it once on a lark, and then uh, you know put it in the closet, and that's where it stays. Yeah, I ended up being pretty happy with this. This is the only picture of Lonnie that we had for a really long time, um, and I was really glad to actually come up with something that we liked, uh, since this kind of thing is really hard, especially when um, it is such a major character. Um, uh, the other thing is. Um, Lonnie has a cross necklace. Um, she uh, also has some Catholicism in her family. Yeah, and I think that's something that I don't think that particular detail has been called out by anybody. Exactly. People notice like the Bibles and and whatnot, but yeah, I I intended for Lonnie, like I thought it would be interesting if she came from a more conservative family than than Sam's in that 
she actually wears a cross necklace and carries some, you know, Catholicism with her, and her dad was an army guy, and, you know, um, her background is even, in some ways, maybe kind of more stifling than Sam's, and that's probably why she's a more, like, openly rebellious person on the outside. I was uh, one of the hosts of the Idle Thumbs video game podcast for a year or two, and I you know, go on there and every once in a while those guys are my friends, and I didn't want to put Idle Thumbs references all over the game, but I did want to have Idle Thumbs references in the game, so we localized them entirely to this one piece of paper. Uh, so almost everything on here is an Idle Thumbs reference, and specifically to a weird exchange that we had about Will Wright's GDC talk in like 2008, where he didn't want everybody to show up and crowd the place, so he gave his speaker name as Phaedrus, um, and then did a talk about a bunch of crazy stuff, including the idea of rocket mail, which was going to be like done by the, it was, it was pitched by the U.S. Postal Service in the 50s and stuff, so... And, and then the thing on the podcast was about how Phaedrus had a little brother, and so, anyway, whatever. The brother, of course it's a Phaedrus, and you can't hardly see the icon in the back because it's obscured, but there's this 50s rocket icon in the back that's like the the logo of, um, of Phaedrus Motors. And then also it's a, a ditch. The reference that Will Wright was making, and that is a secondary reference here because it's a motorcycle thing, is that in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, the book... Um, the author is having kind of an ongoing exchange with this this character of um, of from Greek history called Phaedrus and motorcycles and blah blah blah. So it's a big knot of obnoxious references to lots of different stupid things. Um, Barfberger is enjoyed by all. Um, I so so the thing is, I drew the Barfberger uh, because I drew all of Lonnie's drawings. Um, so I drew the uh, two cats on the motorcycle and uh, yeah, the Captain Lego drawings and stuff like that. Um, and that was that was really. Be I think that it goes hand in hand with I did Lonnie's handwriting in the game and. Carla did Sam's handwriting, and that was partly because the two of us were going to be working the most closely on this stuff, and so being able to just quickly, like, rewrite a note that we wanted to change and scan it and update the game and not have to, like, email somebody to say, oh, could you write that again or whatever was really useful, and also we both just happened to have sloppy teenager handwriting that looks believably uh, 17 years old. Also... I have a believably 17-year-old level of drawing skill, so uh, that worked too. Um, but it, it was it was fun because basically the notes were created in real life in essentially the same way they were in the fiction, where I would write my part of the note and then hand the piece of paper to Carla and she would write her part of the note, and we just constructed it that way. of Gone Home is about pointless interactivity <laughs> that is sort of things being interactive for the sake of them being interactive but um, it really comes from our inspirations of immersive sims uh, like System Shock and Bioshock and Thief where um, a big part of the design philosophy behind those games and Gone Home is that the world needs to be really internally consistent and there's this feeling that if there's something that your character might do, you should be able to do it in the game. So in Bioshock, for instance, you can flush all the toilets and you can turn on all of the faucets, and that's also true in like Deus Ex and uh, and, and Dishonored. Like, and sometimes you know, like the water fountains in Deus Ex give you like one health or whatever, but really you can interact with them because there's this expectation of if you could interact with that, if you encountered it in this world, we should let you do that, right? So. Um, you know, all of the faucets in our game uh, can be turned on, and they are just, they can be turned on so that you can turn them on, and you can flush all the toilets, and it extends into 
our philosophy behind you can pick up every plastic cup and toothbrush and Kleenex box, not because it's going to add a whole lot to your understanding of this world to be able to look at the underside of a cup, but to pay off that expectation and say to the player, yeah, you could pick that up and look at it, so we're going to let you do that. And it's going to be consistent interactively with the stuff that is important. And that makes it your job to look at everything and give it your attention and for you to decide and understand and figure out what has significance and what doesn't, and not for us to tell that to you. The boxes of tampons uh, that you can find in the washrooms around the house, uh, they weren't originally on the list of items that needed to be modeled, but when you're creating a bathroom at the level of fidelity and when you're, you're creating a bathroom for a teenage girl, no less, uh, the idea of not having something like that is... Uh, it's kind of jarring, or it was kind of jarring to me. Um, especially because when you're at that age, your period is something that um, kind of really defines your, your mood at any given day, and maybe what you wear and where you go. So, uh, you know, I just thought it was, uh, you know, something necessary for visual storytelling, especially of a girl going through what she's going through. Well, I mean, I've always, one of the most comforting things in the world to me is having somebody like brush my hair or stroke my head like my mom when I wasn't feeling well. I'd lie down in her lap to just brush my hair. It would always make me feel better. Like the weirdest way, I couldn't figure out why, but it just seemed like this friendly connection to somebody that it, it is, like she says, it is strangely intimate in a way that I'd not really, I guess, put into words until reading that part of the script. Where that's what I was thinking of was like, that connection, that sort of human touch, that it's something so friendly and so loving that you can do. And that that whole idea of like touching someone's scalp being so intimate, just it just made me think of that. Just those wonderful little moments where just a touch can be so much more. Life cycle of the condom. That's a small little thing, too. The life cycle of the condom All right. by Carla Zamanja is as follows. Uh, initially, we the uh, condom was a separate plot point. It was an actual plot point. Um, we gave it to uh, Lonnie, and we had Sam find it in Lonnie's purse, and it made Sam worried um, about what the hell she was doing with it, etc. And uh, that was uh, sort of a wedge to drive them apart when that was the storyline, which it no longer is. Uh, and because we decided we hated it. <laughs> um, but uh, I had already made the um, the condom asset, uh, which I'm actually really proud of. I really like that condom. <laughs> it's really good. Um, also, I think Nero is a really good brand for condoms. Anyway. Uh, yeah, it's a play on Trojan and everything, yeah, but it obviously. works. And... But it's, you know, it's the whole, like... Uh, notably decadent, you know, right, it's like, yeah. it's per- anyway, I like it. I'm, yeah. pr- I'm proud of this thing. Uh, the, so The specular on it looks really nice. <laughs> it does look good. I don't know. Yeah. So we, we had this, you know, extra asset lying around, and <clears throat> and we were like, we were, we were all, oh, it's a shame that it's going to waste, but, you know, whatever, sometimes things don't get used. And then we remembered the horror of digging around in your parents' drawers and finding their condoms and stuff and being just utterly fucking horrified. And uh, we decided we'd give that to you, the player. (laughs) One of my favorite things that came out during development was someone uh, wrote an email mistakenly referring to mittens, and Steve replied in the voice of Katie, saying, it's just Mitten. She's only one cat, Mom. Another board game. Uh, This one wasn't done by me, though. This one was done by Carla. Uh, But I really like it because the ghost figures on the back of the game are actually uh, long-deceased family members of mine. Um, When I was home at Christmas, I was digging through my family's basement, sort of getting an idea of what a a basement has in it. just sort of for set dressing purposes, and while I was down there, I found a big box that my family actually um, hadn't seen. 
we got a big box of things from my grandmother after she passed away. And inside this box was all these tin types, um, love letters and, and um, sort of emigration papers and notes from as far back as the 1850s when my family had emigrated from Scotland and Ireland. And um, um, I asked my family if it was possible that I include these in some sort of artistic project, and they said, sure, they gave me their blessing. And I scanned them, and I didn't know if they were actually going to make it in the game, but um, then I saw that Carla had made this game, and uh, really that they showed up as, as ghosts on the back of it. Um, and it's, it's sort of, uh, I think, a nod, of, nod for idle thumbs as well, who uh, really feel quite passionately about uh, ghosts, as it turns out. Surprise! So th there's a lot less density in the house than there would be in a real house. Like if you look around your house, there's just junk piled everywhere. Probably <laughs> like it's just our house. I think it's most house. <laughs> oh, you're um, right. <laughs> but uh, so you know, our strategy was you either fully invest in something and you know put like a plausible representation of this aspect of a room in, or you just don't put it in at all. And the player will fill in the gaps between like, oh, these are all the things that represent the kind of room I'm supposed to be in, and it doesn't jump out at me that there's no toilet plungers in the bathroom or, or whatever. But the biggest mm -hmm. instance of this that I think actually totally worked because no one has ever called yeah, it out is, surprise, think about it, there are no shoes in this house. Mm. Ta-da! Where's <laughs> uh, your brain now? <laughs> and, and I don't think anybody's noticed it. I yeah. think it's because if we had put one pair of shoes or two pairs of shoes, people would have said, where are all the rest of the shoes? Right. But really, to have a plausible house, mom would have to have ten pairs of shoes and her work boots, and dad would need to have some tennis shoes and some work shoes and so on and so forth. So we just said, there aren't going to be any shoes, and we hope nobody notices. Almost none of the events, the little events uh, in the game, are scripted um, as far as like triggering when you do something specific. So all of the thunder and lightning and the creaky noises in the house, um, they're all just randomized on timers. Um, the only like scripted, scripted thing is in the um, secret passageway when you look at the crucifix there's scripting that detects that you did that and then it causes the light to, to pop, um, which is the, yeah, my one indulgence of like messing with the player. Um, but we've had a lot of people play the game and say, you know, oh, the way you scripted it so that right when I walked into the TV room there was that big thunder and lightning strike, like, that, that was really spooky or, or, you know, I walked through that one door and then you played that sound behind me. And it's like, <laughs> it's awesome that the combination of all the different kind of like significant actions you can do in the game, right. like crossing into a new room or opening a door or this out of the other thing, and the randomization of, of stuff can make it seem like the random elements have extra significance to them, but in fact it's like you just got lucky basically. Yeah, it's total apophenia because like, yeah, it's just because uh, there's, yeah, there's enough random things going on and you can do enough things that eventually some of them are going to line up, yeah. which is, you know, cool. I really enjoyed playing Gone Home. Um, I have to say it was pretty exciting to find the Heavens to Betsy tape, you know, because that was really, I mean, those songs really did come out on a cassette tape at the time, and that really was how people discovered the music was was getting a cassette tape passed around um, so getting to put it in the actual tape player and play it and listen to our song um, it definitely gave me chills I mean it was like wow you know how exciting for a young person today just to get that that moment of discovery um, and to listen to our music I mean it's I think it's great Uh, okay, the wildfire book. Oh man, look at this thing. Yeah, I, uh, this was another one of those situations in which I totally felt like a weird creepo when I was doing research, <laughs> and there was a lot of, uh, really horrifying romance novel covers. Uh, this poor guy, um, was on somebody's Flickr account, uh, that was, um, allowed, that was, a uh, Creative Commons Attribution licensed, um, and, uh, I think he was playing volleyball or something. 
Uh, and, um, I don't know. So you just put suspenders yes. on him and put an axe in his hand, and now he's a fireman. Yes, I did! <laughs> it's the I best. did it, and I will cop to it, and I do it again. Um, also, uh, as I recall, because I'm a noob, I initially picked total bondage suspenders. That's true. I, I, wa I So you had started working on it, and I went upstairs, and then I came back down. And, like, Yarn and, and I were, like, you know, look, we're all like, hmm, what should we do for this and thing? I was, and I was like, like yeah. those are fucking leather dead suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? And what I should have said is, damn it, he noticed. <laughs> um, this is where you find the first half of Sam's Locker, or I guess it's actually the second half of Sam's Locker combo as far as uh, what the piece of paper is. But um, at first, I, there were... The, this the, the the locker combination sheet was torn into three pieces so you had one digit um, on on each of them and it was actually right before we sent out our our IGF build to the judges it was the night before and Carla came down to the basement and she was like at three composing the ambient exploration tracks definitely ended up being the weirdest part of creating music for gone home the audio diaries tended to take precedence since they had such clear criteria for completion, so the ambient tracks were the last things I did. I spent so long immersed in the logs, which were very specifically timed, uh, that to suddenly shift gears to creating these slow, standalone five-minute pieces was surprisingly difficult. I remember giving Steve a first stab at the ambient track for part two of the game, and I didn't hear anything back about it. When I eventually asked if he had any feedback, he said something like, Oh yeah, it's great, I just slowed it down by 50% and it totally works, <laughs> which cracked me up, uh, because I definitely didn't have that in mind. Um, but that's one of the great things about collaborative work, uh, so I just went with it. I ended up doing a number of further revisions where I'd alter elements of the original version uh, specifically to affect how the 50% slowed version would sound. It was definitely a new experience for me, writing bits of music and trying to imagine how they would sound after it's been considerably distorted. They got weirder, though. The ambient track for Part 1 ended up being a backwards version of the slowed-down Part 2 track. And again, there were elements that sounded good at 50% slow forwards, but not at 50% slow backwards, so again, I went back to the original track and started altering elements so they would sound better at half speed in reverse. Um, I don't know if that's a thing ambient composers end up getting used to, but for me it definitely felt like going down the rabbit hole. One of the uh, larger assets that we needed for the basement to really give it character and personality was a furnace. And uh, when we were initially thinking of the furnace, Steve had mentioned to me the furnace from uh, Home Alone, which if you're from... Uh, if you grew up in the 90s like I did, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I did a lot of research and uh, looked up stuff that could kind of evoke a similar feeling. And we finally settled upon octopus furnaces, which are like um, they're th uh, thematically and um, time-wise very appropriate. Uh, they're these giant hulking monstrosities with all these arms covered in asbestos. Uh, really perfect, so we ended up modeling one of those and put it in the corner and I think it turned out okay. So two things. Uh, one, mom's Canadian. Yay! Two, mom didn't start out Canadian. <laughs> um, the reason that mom is Canadian is because uh, Kate Craig and Emily Carroll are Canadian, and early on in um, in in the development of the game, Emily did mom's handwriting. Um, this is before uh, she did any of the UI text or anything. Right, and it was before we decided that all the moms were going to actually be written by moms and all that kind of stuff. Integrity um, in moms. And and so uh, we had we had the um, the answering machine note in the foyer, and there what the the line well, what's the actual line that's there? It's like um, neighborhood. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so. The, the line on the thing is, like, Daniel from the old neighborhood called, call him back. And we gave the text to Emily, and she wrote it out longhand and gave it back to us. And then I looked at it, and I realized that she had inserted a U into the word neighborhood. Because it's what you do. Uh, because of being Canadian. And so, to fix that bug, <laughs> instead of removing the U, I said, bug fixed, mom is now Canadian. So there's this little scrap of 
of paper that's hidden under this bedside table, um, and you start to read it, and then Katie makes you stop reading it. Um, and it was this thing where it's it it's it's an exception to the interactive expectations that you have. Like it's one place, I guess, the one place where we really we really impinge on your ability as a player to do what you want and Katie intervenes basically and it, it was this, it was something that I thought was an interesting little one-off way of emphasizing the difference between the player and the character that they're playing as and to you as a player the note's just a note but a reminder that like Sam is Katie's sister, and Katie wouldn't want to read this thing, and she's not going to keep doing it, even if you want her to. You know, there, there was kind of this um, intellectual, cross-cultural, um, like, pen pal thing that happened before the internet. You know, we used to write letters back and forth to each other about our ideas and about how we wanted to change things. And um, so a bunch of these women that I mentioned came up with this idea of Riot Girl, of of being a punk rocker that was also an in-your-face feminist. There was a little bit of concern on my part before any of this got started that you never know how much liberty you're going to be given and how much over-direction you're going to get because somebody hears it like a specific, specific way, and if you deviate from that at all, it, you're just going to keep doing the line over and over and over again, like 50 times until it's right. So I really wasn't sure what to expect, but even on the first day getting in there and being able to go through a few of the lines and just give them what came to mind, and seeing how closely I think everyone was on the page about it. So the direction was always really positive, and it was always kind of um, coming from either additional information that changed the context of what I was reading, or a certain change in the phrasing, or the way something is being, you know, a pause here, or maybe move it to here, or instead of emphasizing this word, try this one instead. So you end up with a lot of different takes that really give it a very different feeling, depending on which one you go for. Putback is the feature that I'm happiest with in the game. It actually came about as sort of a little bit of an accident. Um, Playtesters had told us they didn't want to feel like some kind of horrible person rummaging around this house and tossing everything on the floor. But there wasn't really any other option initially. Um, that's all you could do was sort of try and lob things back into the place. Um, so, you know, I had done uh, some code before for placing turrets and things in other games where it, uh, you know, will arbitrarily orient an object to be perpendicular to surface and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, I told Steve that, you know, we'd have a lot of edge cases with that and it would take some time to implement and uh, temporarily I would just give him the ability to um, put uh, objects that these things would kind of uh, stick to um, in the game. And we tried that and it worked so well that we decided to keep that. And that's uh, where Putback came from. Fanzines, I mean, that's one of the things that we started doing right away was doing these Riot Girl fanzines. And everyone would contribute and write, um, you know, an article for it. Um, and then we'd compile it and make these Riot Girl fanzines and we would mail them out to people. I mean, I'll, you know, all this is so funny to talk about it before the internet, but, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, we used the mail and people would write, you know, we had a P.O. box and we started getting letters because people would um, read in someone else's fanzine, there's this Riot girl thing that started happening, right? And um, it just, I mean, I, it was the most incredible thing. It just snowballed. It just, people just, girls wanted to be a part of it immediately across the country. Right, so for the time we started Heavens to Betsy in 1991, I think it was only a year later, right? So one year of Riot Girl meetings and these letters happening and these fantasies happening. Well, a year later we left on the Riot Girl tour, the Heavens to Betsy Bratwell Riot Girl tour from Olympia to DC. Well, 
for some reason it took us like almost five weeks to get there on this tour and we ended up staying in dc another something like five weeks before the riot girl convention that happened so that all of this you know all of these fanzines all these girls across the country started getting interested in riot girl and the press just went bananas i mean the press attention was off the hook new york times usa today all these journalists wanted information and wanted to to interview all of us um and it was it was just it was yeah it was crazy so by the time we got to the riot girl convention suddenly we were truly part of a movement 